lot of the people have told me that it's changed their lives. I can see it's very genuine, their lives have changed. It became apparent that the direction that Rob was going in all along was the direction of mindfulness, teaching things in a very experiential, accessible way. We were training people to teach and Rob really wanted to make sure that, you know, the people that are trained to teach just didn't go and sort of scatter to the four winds, but we came together as some kind of an association. Mindfulness has a, has a voice that's slightly turning up now, and I think um, we all need to shout a bit louder for, for the benefits of what it can do on a larger scale, not just for individuals. After um, university, I worked as a patent lawyer, mm -hmm. and um, I did that for about 20 years. Um, and um, my daughter Jennifer, when she was born, uh, you know, up until that point, I'd very much been in control of everything in my life and felt that, you know, if I, if I planned for things, that's how they would turn out. And then after she was born, it was a bit of a disaster because she wasn't very well. She was sick all the time. I, all I had in my head was, a, you know, something telling me, you know, this is wrong. It shouldn't be like this. What am, what am I doing wrong? And I got very low and, uh, you know, I found it incredibly stressful and I was working as well. And so I thought, oh, well, yoga makes you quite relaxed, doesn't it? So I started, um, I got like, um, I think it was a video in those days, not even a DVD, um, of yoga and I would practice yoga at home. And then I found a yoga class and through that, um, the yoga teacher arranged for us, for, for Rob Nairn to come to give, give a talk and to guide some meditation sessions. And I kind of went along to that and um, I, was really, I was really amazed by the ideas and, and the practices. And, and then Rob came the following year and I remember he was in the Mechanics Institute in Whaley Bridge and I was sat there in the audience and I was thinking, wow, that's got to be the coolest job in the world, like teaching meditation like without imagining in a million years that I would ever do anything like that. And my first degree was maths and physics, so I come from quite a scientific background and I, when I was working as a lawyer that was very scientific as well, the area of law that I was working in. And my yoga teacher, she arranged for us to do a trip to Sami Ling for a yoga weekend. And I remember arriving at Sami Ling and, and, and you know like uh, there's prayer flags everywhere and like these really colourful statues and, and like I went into the temple and like you know, the rational part of me would, you know, kind of would recoil, but I really felt at home. I really felt that I was coming home and I really recognised that place as somewhere that, you know, I could, I could be part of. So my name is Heather Regan Addis, I'm in the lecture hall at Samueling Tibetan Centre and we're in the first full day of our 2019 conference. My name is Chiden, for those who don't know me, and I've known Rob for many years. Uh, I first met him in Cape Town in the 80s. I was a law student at the University of Cape Town and Rob was a professor of criminology in the same department but our paths never crossed in the University of Cape Town which is very odd. I met him because I went to a talk one day by, he gave a talk at the Theosophical Society on Carl Jung and Tibetan Buddhism. I was very interested in Carl Jung, not so much Tibetan Buddhism then. But it was one of those talks which is just riveting and you know where you look back in your life and there are a few things that change the course of your life and one of those was that talk and it always struck me what a wonderful teacher Rob was and the way he could communicate with such clarity. So after that my law career started going down the tubes although I finished and I went to a retreat with Rob at a Catholic seminary. Uh, he used to run retreats at Catholic seminaries. And it was very much then Vipassana. He was teaching a Vipassana meditation. And then he eventually left the um, University of Cape Town, resigned his professorship, and started a, a little center in the Karoo, in a kind of semi-desert part of South Africa. 
I think he hoped he'd get away from the world, but the problem is the world followed him there. <laughs> and I attended many retreats with many others there. And then Rob eventually went, came to Sammy Ling, where he had a connection with Akko Rinpoche, did a four-year retreat. I kind of followed him here too, did a three-year retreat afterwards. And so that's my little potted history of Rob. I've always known Rob to be a wonderful, compassionate, kind human being too. Uh, yeah, so great friend and mentor. So Rob Nan. <laughs> We had this Buddhist group that, that met at, at my house on a Sunday evening and uh, we would do, like listen to some CDs of meditation and, and discussion and then we would do the Buddhist Chenrezy practice. Um, and over time I was required to take more and more responsibility for holding the group and uh, guiding practices and that kind of thing and I wanted to make sure that if I did that, I wouldn't be doing any harm because you're working with people's minds mm. and you just need to be really careful. So um, I heard about this master's degree at the University of Bangor in Wales um, in mindfulness. So I applied for that and um, started on that and did two years of that. Uh, and as part of that, had some teacher training, mindfulness teacher training. I think we both were living on Holyoke. Um, Rob had been coming for many years to, to the island and um, always drawing really big crowds and getting people so enthusiastic about meditation. And so then I remember a conversation in the dining room with him where he, where he was talking about this grand vision of, um, of, of moving into more secular universal mindfulness and um, and yeah, wanting to train up. I think at that point he said he wanted to train 120 teachers, and uh, and I remember feeling daunted and like thinking that I would not be the right kind of person at all to do that. But <laughs> it's maybe a bit too honest. But as all my friends were doing it, <laughs> oh god, maybe I shouldn't say that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me do that bit again. <laughs> I have a memory of um, the, the main hall on Holy Hour, the Peace Hall, and everybody sort of spreading out in the hall with the, with the intention to create groups that would start the vision. I think Rob must have initiated it, and there was a, a real momentum, and then a, a lot of the people who were involved really got things going at that point. Rob started his first mindfulness course at, at, at Sami Ling with Choden um, in the summer of 2008 and I joined that as a, one of the participants and it was quite funny because there was three weekends in a retreat so one weekend I didn't go and the other two weekends I didn't make it to the end of the weekend because so um, you know I'd been quite got quite emotional so I'd left early and then <laughs> But when it came to the retreat, because Rob knew I'd been studying at Bangor, he said, why don't you join the teaching team? So the thing about joining the teaching team is that you can't leave early. You can't run away. <laughs> You've got to stay. So, um, so I joined the teaching team and started working with Choden and Rob on that, on that retreat on, uh, on Holy Island. We bit off more than we can chew with the initial course because there were so many people interested in the 2008 course, which is overambitious too. And we hadn't had experience of running trainings. Now, Rob had done, been a teacher for many years, but this was a training, actually, and a teacher training, which is quite difficult. So when again came to the retreat, um, we realized we needed more help. And then Heather was on the course as a student, but then Rob upgraded her from a student to a teacher, which is quite an unusual thing, you know? <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> yeah, because she had the experience of doing the Bangor Masters, which is very helpful, you know? And she had very good organizational skills. So she went from a student to a teacher on the first uh, course we did, and then she's been involved ever since. That first course we did on that retreat, you know, Rob, we were training people to teach, and Rob really wanted to make sure that, you know, the people that had trained to teach just didn't go and sort of scatter to the four winds, but we came together as some kind of an association. So he was really keen uh, about that. And on that retreat, there were two people who were quite successful, well, successful businessmen. So there was Norton Bertram Smith and Vin Harris. 
And so kind of we, we, we got together and had some ideas. I remember we had a conversation sitting on the veranda of the Peace Hall, Norton and, and Finn and myself, about you know, how, how we were gonna, kind of how we might set up this, this uh, organization and, and run it. So my first mindfulness teaching was in 2001, uh, back in Brighton, yeah. Um, you know, for all those reasons of personal tragedies and all those type of things. Um, went and did a, did a, a 10 week course, I think it was in Brighton, the Mindfulness of Breath. Um, and that really had a huge effect on me. Um, it almost led to the fact that of jumping off the corporate world and setting up my own company to, as everybody does, try and help everybody else do these, these things um, up in uh, Scotland. And I was trying to introduce mindfulness into my leadership development courses. And I saw an advert for a mindfulness uh, course on Holy Island. And it was, ah, oh, I need to get in touch with these people because they can help me come and teach the, the mindfulness courses on my leadership program. So I phoned up Holy Island and Chodden answered the phone. Said, can you believe it? Yeah, because I think he was based on Holy Island at that stage, yeah. Um, he phoned up and he said, well, uh, we can't do that for you, but we can teach you to do it. <laughs> and it was, okay, hadn't thought of that. So then went, uh, went on the course on uh, Holy Island on 2008. Um, and that's how I met Rob. So he was you know, the guy in charge. And I said to Rob, you know, and I'll quite help you you know, is there anything I can do to help you, you know? And he said, yes, there is actually. <laughs> um, uh, we'll be in touch to, to do that. Um, because uh, I, I don't know what had happened, but there'd been some discussion about, you know, get somebody to help you that had already set up a successful business and done all that. I'll never forget this uh, the conversation in Vin Harris's house where, where you'd all had some discussion and I arrived and he said, um, and we've decided that you're going to be the director and we'll all support you. And I said, no, 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 I'm not going to be the director on my own. It doesn't work like that, yeah? Um, and therefore, then we made Heather, Regan Agus and Chodden directors as well. For the first couple of years when I first started teaching, I was teaching alongside Rob. And then the Mindful Association just kind of, it started to happen very organically. So I know that, that Heather came onto the scene as one of Rob's students and someone who then started kind of helping Rob out and teaching with Rob. Um, and I'm not sure there was a time where I noticed like, oh, that's the Mindfulness Association. What I noticed was Heather was working with Rob and they started to develop this vocabulary, um, which Rob was using and Heather was using and other teachers started using. And I was like, oh, they're, they're kind of starting something here. And that was when I started to, to notice this thing was forming organically. And I think that was probably me noticing the, the first uh, arisings of, of, the, of what would become Mindfulness Association. I think just different conditions came together and, you know, it became apparent that the direction that Rob was going in all along was the direction of mindfulness, teaching things in a very experiential, accessible way, okay? And um, so I, I sort of teamed up with him as a kind of uh, supporter and then Heather got involved, and Vin, and Norton, Christine, Faye, and this kind of unstoppable momentum started, which became the Mindfulness Association.
Some scientists suggest a brain training technique called mindfulness could help teenagers manage stress. Our own research by mindfulness trainers, the potential project. Has mindfulness at work is really a series of tools and techniques. We're talking about peaceful, relaxing minds. Um, we can make ourselves mentally stronger by using um, things like mindfulness, uh, interventions like mindfulness. That can, you can focus on what I was beginning to get worried at the number of people claiming to be teaching mindfulness who had not had any experience. Mm -hmm. So they were inventing what they thought was mindfulness and because it was the flavor of the, of the month, they were getting lots of people following them and they were teaching them the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. So that's when I thought of putting together a course and I did that, and simultaneously Lomayeshi said he wanted a course on mindfulness or something similar, and simultaneously somebody from uh, Aberdeen University arrived and asked if we could teach a course on how to train people to think. Mm -hmm. So I said, no, but we will teach you mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And that's how the connection with Aberdeen University began. Uh, this is the Manchester Buddhist Centre um, in the northern quarter in Manchester and this is where MAHQ meet twice a month. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So we all work from home most of the time. We have the best team in the world really, don't we? We do, yes. Yeah, we all get on very well and have a good laugh when we're here. We do, it's good to see, it's, it's all well and good working from home, but it's good to connect and see people in person. Yeah, although, although everyone tends to work too hard and it's really difficult to get everybody to stop and have a lunch break, isn't it? Yeah, it can be a bit uh, <laughs> too, um, what's the word? Yeah, focused on work. Yeah. Yeah, I have a great team that work really, really hard. It's wonderful. We need to work on that, like, you know, more chatting, less work. Less work. Shall we go? Shall we go in? Yeah, let's go in. Yes. We're just filming, you know how it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, are you being filmed, girl? Yeah, do you know, it's our 10 year anniversary next May. Right, and that's so, why they all look so lovely, huh? That's why you're all dressed up. <laughs> that's why we've brushed They don't look like this, you know. They don't. <laughs> oh, I really don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, girls are really good. Oh, no. Right, let's go in. Let's see how everyone's doing. Hello, everybody. Hi. 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 Hi Graham, how are you? How are you doing? I'm all right, thank you. Yeah. I'm okay. Yeah, I'm cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, Graham, it's like ten years since we actually started the master's program, and we worked a lot in the couple of years up to the start um, to get the program up and running. What do you remember about those days? Oh gosh, um, it's going back to. My first kind of contacts with uh, Sammy Lane back to 2005, I guess, with student teachers, school pupils before that, actually, and um, discussions with children in particular around mindfulness in schools and education. And then him eventually saying, you know, this, this mindfulness thing could be big. Um, people are beginning to explore this in all sorts of places. What do you think? And um, from the Sammy Ling side, of course, there was there was interest. Um, um, Lama Yeshi and obviously Chodron and, and I think Rob and due course as well. And um, that and led to what was a fairly interesting, difficult and important process of clarification of thinking about what exactly we're going to try and do. Um, 
I guess maybe there's a bit of naivety as well on our part. That would be an easy thing to do, to create a, a, a mindfulness program. And um, of course, you're dealing with a, a university that's um, six centuries old and has got ways of doing things. And um, they're worried that this is some kind of seminary for would-be Buddhists. Um, so that, that, as I say, sharpened our, our thinking. So it, it felt painful at the time, but I think it was really important. Um, all that quality of students hoops that we have had to dance through and continue to dance through actually um, allowed us to create a program and then we 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 we, we um, had some pilots we kind of t- to a group of student teachers the Holy Island and Jordan and Alistair Wilson led us there and it was a brilliant retreat and sparkling Hebridean sunshine as usual and um, yeah that went really well and that, that made us think yeah we've got something here we've got, we've got a runner I think what I do remember is when Aberdeen advertised the course for the first time, they got 200 applicants and they were totally blown away. They, they never expected anything like that. And I think the authorities were suspicious to have so many, because in the beginning they said we've got to have at least 14 people to make the course viable and there were 200 <laughs> applicants. So they thought, is this some kind of strange cult, you know, is Rob Nan a cult leader, you know? I came across the master's course the Mindful Association Master's Course because a friend recommended it. At the time I was uh, facilitating Buddhist meditation um, sessions near where I lived in, in Edinburgh and somebody who's here this weekend in fact said, Gavin I think you should try this um, and I read the brochure and I thought that's amazing, that looks great because uh, it allows me to combine what I'm interested in, which is which was exploring meditation practice at the time, but also how it applies to work. So I was working as a nurse at the time, and this seemed to tick all the boxes. I would be able to train as a practitioner, but also learn something at the same time that I could then um, deliver to young people that I was working with at the time and or my colleagues. So it was perfect. So yes, I was part of the uh, first cohort and it was both a good thing and a slightly daunting thing because uh, that cohort was filled with people who um, had loads and loads of experience. You know the first cohort people often say it was a challenging cohort but that's because it was you know being trialed um, but it was very rich because it was very raw it was very you know people were very uh, strong in their opinions. I think the other thing in that first cohort is that uh, many of the participants were actually uh, long-standing meditators as well and they had very strong opinions about things so it wasn't like a you know a group of school kids or anything. it was people who had a lot to offer and a lot to help in in you know laying the, the groundwork for shaping the program in the future. I really enjoyed the, being part of that cohort and doing the master's degree. I thought it was really well done. Um, as in the, the teachers were, ex- they were themselves experienced, but more than anything, they were just highly skilled with people. You know, they were very containing. So yes, there were um, challenging moments in that cohort, but actually they were, it was very well contained and it was well contained within the, the practice and they, they embodied um, what they, um, they embodied mindfulness really in the way that they delivered um, the, the training. The Mindfulness Association as an as a organisation, as a legal entity, was set up um, so that we were able to contract with the university to um, set up this master's programme, which started in September 2009, and we're now recruiting our 10th cohort. So we've had between sort of 35 and 50 people each year on that master's programme over the past nine years and as I say we're just recruiting our 10th cohort now. It's it's funny people always ask about goals and ambitions um, but we've never really set any. You know like when we started we didn't think oh we want to be here like you know we've written two books now and we're writing a third book Uh, So we've written the book on mindfulness, a book on insight, and we're now going to write a book on compassion. Um, And there's the Mindful Heroes book as well that's written around the master's programmes. We'd never imagined that we'd write books, but we have done. And it's the same with our courses and how they've grown. I mean, our courses are run in several different countries as well. And, you know, we never thought that, we never thought, oh yes, we must go and get our courses delivered in X number of countries. We just um, see what opportunities present themselves.
And I think if you have goals, you, they can blinker you. So if you say, okay, our goal is like, we're gonna go in this direction. And if an opportunity presents itself over here, then you miss it. So, so the, we, it's, it's, more, it's more of an organic thing. And we just sort of are open to whatever opportunities unfold. I think we need to mature as an organization. Um, you know, we've got some stuff that we're learning from. Um, it's going on at the moment. Um, that, that creates a solid uh, center, yeah, from which we can, we can uh, mature from, yeah. And, and, and what I like about what a lot of the decision making is that, that it's, it's uh, we're protecting our core, yeah. We're not just going out there and trying to do everything. We, we, we've learned that from that, haven't we? You know, come back, protect the core, protect what we really believe in, yeah? Um, and just carry on, you know, that'll help us up the next curve. I, I think it'll just keep going from strength to strength. And um, again, there's no real plan, is there? It's no real strategy, just wing it. And like, I think that's always served us well, hasn't it? I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, that's what people do on a daily basis, isn't it? You know, there's no need to be all serious about it. It's like in the room writing business plans, like you should just seize the day and take the opportunity, shouldn't you? A lot of the people have told me that it's changed their lives. And, and they, I can see it's very genuine. Their lives have changed and they're happier and they've got a better perspective on life and they can do more. And that actually is amazing because not many things change people's lives in a beneficial way, but a lot of people do come up and say, even today, for example, three people have come up and said how it's changed their lives and how much better they feel and so on. So that's very inspiring because as Chodan says, it's gained its own momentum and um, I don't feel that I'm doing anything anymore. You know, there are lots of very well-trained people like Heather and Choden who uh, run it all and are very good teachers themselves. And I'm definitely now a spare part <laughs> and very happy to be spare. <laughs> We had an idea to offer Rob some sort of a lifetime achievement award, <laughs> like they do at the Oscars, you know, kind of thing. and uh, we thought we'd say a few words. And I had some stuff written on my phone, and now the battery's gone. So I'm going to be like really showing, be spontaneous. Um, I was thinking of that quote. You know, they say that in many ways that the, the guru is even more important than the Buddha, because through the guru you you, you reach the Buddha. And then I thought, well, then what about the person who introduces you to your guru? They must also be incredibly important, and for me, that's the role that Rob Nam played for me. Um, I met Rob when I was uh, 21 or, or 22 or something. He had read this uh, this book, Living, Dreaming, Dying, which is one of the first Dharma books I'd seen to mention lucid dreaming. And I went and see him speak in, uh, in London, and followed him out to South Africa. And uh, it was Rob Nam who first said, um, "Oh, speak to Lama Yeshe about your lucid dreams. There might be something interesting there." So it was really Rob who gave me that first connection to Rinpoche, so I'm so grateful for him for that. And I think in this room there are probably dozens of people who have had their first connection with mindfulness or meditation through Rob Nairn. Who, who would say that, oh, raise your hands, who, who might have had their first connection? Yeah. So there's a room full of mindfulness teachers here now, and if you've learned anything through mindfulness association, then in some way you've learned it through Rob, because he founded this, he, he made this whole thing happen. Um, and I want to do this whole thing about saying how when he was 21, he was the youngest ever magistrate in Zimbabwe and all this kind of stuff. But I don't think that's nearly as important as just acknowledging the connection this band has offered. And to celebrate what a brilliant human being he is and how helpful he's been. And as Rinpoche often says, this is about being a helpful human being. And <laughs> Okay, the <laughs> <laughs> man is a very helpful human being. So I'll uh, leave a round of applause for all.
calm down. <laughs> now in our lineage, when we say lineage transmissions uh, means they give your head. If you're a lama, they give you this uh, Gampupa's head. If you're a lay person, I am now passing him my lineage empowerment. Come on, bro. <laughs> <laughs> then reflecting on our intention for this practice, maybe an intention to be curious about the process of how thought becomes thinking, and particularly how that unfolds in terms of physical sensations in the body. And then reflecting on our motivation. Why might it be beneficial for us to be in touch more with the subtle activity of the mind? And how might that also benefit those around us? You know, there's many different courses that you can do in mindfulness, but there is a, there's a voice that's arising that's saying, but what can this mindfulness field do in the world? It's, it's great that we can work in ourselves um, and, you know, hopefully become better people, but, you know, where's, where's the power in that? What can we actually do in the world? From my perspective, this, this journey that we've been on has taken us through to you know, looking at the diversity of mindfulness and how diverse is it? And who is it including? Who is it excluding maybe? What is it including? What is it excluding? And where are the gaps? What I'm seeing in, in, in how mindfulness is evolving and even the Mindfulness Association is this there seems to be a sense of willingness for the practice and teachers to move out beyond self mm. and, in, in, and develop programs and structures for all beings to be well, you know, that really explicitly invite all beings to practice. Some of us within the Mindfulness Association notice that most of the people coming in our courses got a lot of benefit from it, People talk about it as being life-changing, and we think it means in a good way. And but were, we were also mostly white, middle-class, middle-aged, senior people, and we got a lot from it. But we thought, <coughs> what about people who, with respect, you know, got much more challenging lives than ours? And they, what would happen if they got access to mindfulness? So we started a, a small charity called the Everon Project. Um, and we raised funds, and so far we've managed to fund courses for over 700 people uh, to have an eight-week mindfulness course from groups in society who wouldn't otherwise have access to mindfulness. And we researched it, and the, the story of that is in the, the last chapter of the book. And it does work. I mean, it, it really, really helps people. The lives are chaotic, and we need to be a little bit more flexible in how we deliver the programs but there's definitely a potential for it. I would like it to become much more available to people who haven't found their way to it yet, who for, for whatever reason uh, haven't felt invited or haven't um, had the opportunity to, to practice mindfulness. Um, I think there's, there's quite a lot of work that can be done in that area and I'm really um, really hopeful of the Mindfulness Association playing a good role in that through the Everyone Project for example and the, the way that we're yeah, hoping to, to widen access to mindfulness. The other element that I'm very enthusiastic about is the potential both for mindfulness to um, look more directly at where we can um, where, where we can bring our mindfulness skills to be more mindful of our actions and the results of our, our actions in daily life in quite a deliberate way what we can mean to the world at large and with 
big topics like um, climate change and social injustice, I, I have a sense that mindfulness really has a role to play in that. And I'm looking forward to the Mindfulness Association doing more of that in the future. Maybe if more people are practicing mindfulness and kindness, you know, we'll evolve into a different kind of species that doesn't just kill and harm and cause mayhem, but actually co-creates a healthier, happier world. I think that's definitely possible if a lot of people are doing the same thing. I often think of a beautiful thing His Holiness the Dalai Lama said, practice compassion and be kind to people. And if you can't be kind, at least don't do any harm. <laughs> and I think that's a wonderful thing for people to remember because a lot of people want to be compassionate, but they can't quite make it. So then remember what he said, at least don't do harm. <laughs> what we see at the moment with the mindfulness and insight training is a few people swimming upstream and it's quite a struggle for a few people to swim upstream but if everybody is swimming upstream it will actually turn the stream round and the stream will also flow upstream and then I think you will see that the true potential that humans have to develop their finer qualities and there will obviously be much, much more opportunity to do so because there'll be more people doing it. So it would be, it would be quite a wonderful panacea that we would have. Uh.